Once the extraordinary benefit series celebrating the Alaska Quarterly Review's 40th anniversary. I'm Heather Lindy, and this evening we have three inspiring poets and teachers in our Zoom reading room, and I am wowed to be sharing the space with them. I'm also buoyed, um, as I'm sure you are, by uh, the presence this past week of the Youth Poet Laureate of the United States, Amanda Gorman, at the presidential inauguration, and more than joyful that uh, her poem will be probably remembered much longer than the performances by rock stars whom she upstaged. This series continues most Sundays through April and features readings and conversations with exceptional new and emerging writers, as well as established authors and poets who, like today's guests, have all been published in AQR. We're hosted by the Anchorage Museum at the Rasmussen Center, so thank you. And thank you to our guests and to you for being here. Kunis Chish, as we say in Haines, where I am today on the uh, beautiful and bountiful ancestral and current homeland of the Jukat Kwan and Jukut Kwan people. While all of the readings are free, AQR, like all literary journals, could use your help. So please consider a donation. And thank you to those of you that already have donated. We're well on the way to our goal of $15,000. And uh, now I'd, I'd like to introduce Ronald Spatz, the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Alaska Quarterly Review, a professor of English at the University of Alaska. Ron is a former National Endowment for the Arts Fellow the recipient of two Alaska Governor's Awards and a Contribution in Literacy Award from the Alaska Center for the Book. Under Ron's four decades plus of leadership and vision, Alaska Quarterly Review has created strong connections between our state, Alaska, and the larger literary community, both in the lower 48 and abroad. And AQR has been influential in supporting new and emerging writers as well as presenting works that include a rigorous questioning of larger societal issues. Ron? Thank you, Heather, and welcome everyone. Um, this event is being recorded and will be available on the Alaska Quarterly Review channel on YouTube. Um, the series started on October 4 uh, and um, will end on May 2nd. And so all of the events um, are being uh, archived and they're um, being also divided into uh, reading excerpts. So if you've missed any, uh, feel free to just go back and, and take a look. Um, before we begin, I'd like to make a few important acknowledgements. Uh, Alaska Quarterly Review gratefully acknowledges the Anchorage Museum for hosting and providing technical support for this event and Web 907 for its support and the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts, Alaska Quarterly Review's 501c3 umbrella organization, which makes this, this event possible. I also wanna make a land acknowledgement. Alaska Quarterly Review recognizes indigenous land on which all Alaskans live. AQR is located in Anchorage and Anchorage is the Nina homeland. The Nina is the language spoken by traditional present and future caretakers of this land. Land acknowledgement opens a space with gratefulness and respect for the contributions, innovations, and contemporary perspective of indigenous peoples and marks our collective movement toward decolonization and equity. Today, we're thrilled to present a trio of wonderful poets, Daruba Ahmad, Joe Oshier, and Matthew Zapuda. Um, joining me today as co-moderator, is Heather Lindy. Heather is the author of four books, all published by Algonquin. If you lived here, I'd know your name. Take Good Care of the Garden and the Dogs, Find the Good, which is this year's Alaska Reads book, and her recently published Of Bears and Ballots. And now to begin, I send it over to Heather Lindy. Oh, thanks, Ron. Um, uh, our first uh, reader, well, I guess what I'll do is I'll, I'll tell you about each of our writers and then we'll go ahead and um, uh, uh, introduce our first one. So um, Dilruba Ahmed grew up in Western Pennsylvania and rural Ohio. She is the author of two poetry collections, 
Bring Now the Angels and, and Dake Dust, winner of the Bakeless Prize. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, Ruby, you'll have to correct me. I should have asked you that sooner. My friend Naomi Shehab Nye and another participant in the AQR series had this to say about Dilruba's work in the New York Times when her poem Zodiac was published there. Dilruba Ahmed's luminous second book of poems, Bring Now the Angels, considers layered relationships and identities, adults to parents and children, bystanders as public witness, humans to angels to water or bureaucracy, or as in the poem Zodiac, to the self. The tightly locked heart clinking back to back with the longing to be known offers a deeply sympathetic voice, honest as a friend, endearing from opening to end. Her poetry has appeared in Alaska Quarterly Review, Kenron Review, New England Review, Plowshares and Poetry, and has been anthologized in the Best American Poetry 2019. Halal, If You Hear Me, Literature, The Human Experience, and elsewhere. She is the recipient of the Florida Review's 2006 Editor's Award and the Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Memorial Prize. She is also an editor and a teacher and you may sign up for her writing workshops on her website, dilrubaahmed.com. Jill Osier was born in Iowa, but lives in Fairbanks, Alaska. She has worked as a writer, a laborer, and educator. Her new collection, The Solace Is Not the Lullaby, was chosen as the winner of the 2019 Yale Series of Younger Poets competition. The collection was published by Yale University Press in 2020. Series judge Carl Phillips had this to say about Jill's poems, that they quieted, quietly, cumulatively, persuasively argue for restraint and precision, both too often forgotten in contemporary poetry as tools for the confession that the art of story of telling finally amounts to. Her sensibility, the judge wrote, is unlike any I've encountered before. The poems here are thrilling and strangely new. Jill is also the author of the chat books, Bed Full of Nebraska's and Should Our Undoing Come Down Upon Us White. Her poetry has appeared in Alaska Quarterly Review, Crazy Horse, The Georgia Review, Plowshares, Poetry, and The Southern Review. A recipient of an NEA fellowship, Jill has served as the Diane Middlebrook Poetry Fellow at the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing and Chapbook Fellow at the Frost Place and the George Bennett Fellow at Phillips Exeter Academy. Honors for her work include the Campbell Corner Poetry Award and uh, the Poetry Society of America's Alice Faye D. Castanola Award. And last but not least, <laughs> Matthew Zabruder is a poet, editor, translator, and professor. He is the author most recently of Father's Day and Why Poetry. His other collections of poetry include Sun Bear, Come On All You Ghosts, The Pajamaist, and American Linden. His poems, essays, and translations have appeared in many publications, including Alaska Quarterly Review, Harper's, Bomb, Slate, American Poetry Review, Tin House, Paris Review, The New Republic, The Boston Review, the New Yorker, Vic Sweeney's The Believer, Real Simple, and the Los Angeles Times. His work has been anthologized in Third Rail, The Poetry of Rock and Roll, Legitimate Dangers, American Poets of the New Century, Seriously Funny, Poems About Love, Death, Religion, Art, Politics, Sex, and Everything, and The Best American Poetry um, in several different years. Matthew's awards include a 2011 Guggenheim Fellowship, a Lannan Foundation Residency Fellowship in Marfa, Texas, and the May Sarton Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Science. NPR has this to say about his work. Zabruta's poems have a directness and verve that are reminiscent of Frank O'Hara. They're poems for everyone, everywhere, insisting that everything is subject for poetry and that all language is poetic language, democratic in its insights and feelings. Wow, <laughs> aren't you looking forward to this now? I guess this is the place where I say, without further ado, the poets uh, today have chosen to, um, to speak to us in alphabetical order. Um, so that is the reason 
why we're doing it this way today. So um, uh, Dilruba Ahmed, um, we're so pleased to have you here and uh, you get to go first. Thank you so much, Heather and Ron, for that warm welcome and for inviting me to participate. And a thank you to Cody, who's working behind the scenes to make sure everything goes smoothly. I'm really honored and excited to be here reading with Matthew and Jill to celebrate uh, the 40th anniversary of Alaska Quarterly Review. Um, and a big thank you to anyone who's here listening or watching and tuning in. Um, I'm going to be reading from my second book, which is Bring Now the Angels. This came out uh, in April of this year, of last year, 2020. And um, the first poem is one that came about when I was thinking about the idea of forgiveness um, and um, considering when and how and whether it's possible. Um, and I became interested in the idea of self-forgiveness as a precursor to our forgiveness towards other, other people. This one's called phase one. For leaving the bridge open last night, I forgive you for conjuring white curtains instead of living your life. For the seedlings that wilt now in tiny pots, I forgive you. For saying no first, but yes, as an afterthought. I forgive you for hideous visions after childbirth brought on by loss of sleep. And when the baby woke repeatedly for your silent rebuke in the dark, what's your beef? I forgive you for letting vines overtake the garden, for fearing your own propensity to love, for losing again your bag and route from San Francisco, for the equally heedless drive back on the caffeine-fueled return. I forgive you for leaving windows open in rain and soaking library books again, for putting forth only revisions of yourself with punctuation worked over. Instead of the disordered truth, I forgive you. For singing mostly when the shower drowns your voice. For so admiring the drummer you failed to hear the drum. In forgotten tin cans, may forgiveness gather, cooling in gutters, gushing from pipes, a great steady rain of olives from branches, relieved of cruelty and petty meanness. With it, a flurry of wings, 13 gray pigeons, ointment reserved for healers and prophets. I forgive you, I forgive you, for feeling awkward and nervous without reason, for bearing Keats's empty vessel with such calm, you worried you had perhaps no moral center at all, for treating contempt when she deserved compassion. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. For growing a capacity for love that is great, but matched only, perhaps, by your loneliness. For being unable to forgive yourself first, so you could then forgive others, and at last find a way to become the love that you want in this world. Um, the first half of the book um, deals primarily with my father's three-year battle with multiple myeloma. And um, so this next poem that I'm reading is the, pro the, the poem from which I've taken the title of the book, uh, Bring Now the Angels. And um, I'll read it now. Bring Now the Angels. Bring now the angels to test your pulse as you sleep. Bring the healer, the howler, the listening ear. Bring an apothecary to mix the tincture. We need the salve, the tablet, the capsule of the hour. Bring sword eaters and those who will swallow fire. Fetch the guardian to flatten the wheelchair to hoist it toward heaven. The public shuttle awaits the ceaseless trips to the clinic. To the bedside manner, Summons, summon witness, this medic's disdain toward patients, the physician's dismissal of pain, and call the druggist again to drug us senseless. Bring a nomad to index our debts, tuck each invoice into broken walls of regret. Call the cleric 
the clerk, the messengers divine. Summon someone, collect the prayers, buried or burnt, tied to stones, sunken seas, dunked under water until all dissolves. Bring now the scribe, let it be written. There is no shepherd, no Sherpa, no moonlight guide. Were these the darkest journeys of our lives? Who will lift the shuttle above the outposts of the living? Who will watch it rise and rise? Who will clear a path among all the wreckage? Who will weave a nest for all the birds of passage? Who will bridge a gap between savage and salvage? Who will sing over rough, over wilting stalks, rough husks, silk still gleaming like hair in a dream. Um, these next two poems were written um, soon after I heard the, the news about the previous administration's so-called border at our policy of, of brutally separating um, families. And so it's, it's a relief, um, you know, it's, it's not over that or ordeal, but it's a relief to at least um, talk about it uh, happening actively in the, in the past tense. Um, the first poem is called Appella. This morning, a light so full, so complete, we might ask why the God of sun is also God of plague, why the God of healing is also God of archery. The children under trees, unaware their hearts have become targets, red and inflamed as the eyes of men and thrones, find sticks in the grass to fashion into guns. Some brandish a branch saber. They are sniping the golden light with squinting faces. And everywhere they do not look, fences and more fences. There are no arrows to point the way as they scythe through a woods will dart between cars and parking lots. The miles of fence links grow more and more impassable, even as the children try to follow the voices calling them now, at first with tenderness and then with fierce intensity. This one's called The Children. How each one is taken with care from car to school doorstep, each one hand in hand with an adult. How the mothers and fathers kiss their foreheads, first pushing aside their bangs and smoothing a stray wisp. One parent straightens her daughter's velvet headband, another wipes dried oatmeal from his son's pink lips. How carefully each child is guided around the bumpers of cars. How some turn to wave goodbye one last time while others drawn to friends by an invisible cord move together first left then right with the synchronicity of fish. How even the child with tears in his lashes who cowers near a teacher knows that in a matter of hours a loved one will return to him to return him to the facts of home. Butterfly net for trapping monarchs, foil blanket from a space museum, or the clover charms on a chain. And um, for my final poem, I am um, reading from the second half of the book, the, the last two poems I read are from the second half of the book, which broaden out from personal loss and allergy to broader um, sort of public forms of loss. And um, this is uh, the second to last poem in the book. And I should mention that um, for those of you have, who haven't been to Pittsburgh, in, in Pittsburgh there are um, you know, sort of big one ways of three or four lanes of traffic going one direction and then one lane going <laughs> in the opposite direction for the public buses. So I mentioned a pat bus in here, um, that's what I'm referring to. And I should probably also mention that this poem takes, the structure of the poem takes inspiration from um, the Viewmaster toy from, from my youth, which 
some of you may know are sort of a chunky set of binoculars. You put a slide in and click through to see the various images. Um, and now apparently there's a uh, virtual reality version of the, of the Viewmaster. Um, so this one's called Viewmaster Virtual Reality Starter Pack, Mortality Real. Um, and before I read it, I'd just like to say thanks again to everyone at Alaska Quarterly Review and to um, all of you who are uh, tuning in. Um, in each section, I'll just sort of call out as it goes along. One, a canyon of memory floods as the zip line slips. First bike, first dance, first kiss, broken bone, and more. First love, wedding cake, two kids. Soft spot pulsing on each newborn's crown. And you, in the blur of greenery and river and craggy rock, you release every spring pulley or counterweight that ever held you back. Two, slammed by a pat bus, mercy, swift and painless. Seven angels gasp, but you are unperturbed descending with a steaming non-fat chai tea latte into the counterflow lane from the curb. Three, one moment you leap and dance amid a snow-topped mountain cap backdrop, and the next, without notice, you huddle in bed, doting spouse dropping one perfect tear upon your furrowed brow. Somewhere afar, a sitar twangs and whales, a mysterious virus, rare injury, lightning seizing your whole and healthy spine when you least expect it, no choreography for grief, an entire troop of sequined mourners, it seems, will fail to bring you back. Four, legs crossed upon a mat in the dusty outpost, you attain such enlightenment that time slows, giving you full minutes to regard the smooth cartridge hurtling toward your chest. It makes of the air a gel, a web, a balloon stretched to snap. Welcome to bullet time. You were never so much in your life as you were around it, observing it, remarking on it. Given this moment of dead time, you can at last see from every given viewpoint. Five, overpriced vintage fountain pen pokes through your bag, piercing your backside. Infection follows and you fall to sepsis, bringing credence to claims that daily writing involves risk. Six, pitch darkness, silence, pure emptiness, a familiar voice in the distance. Seven, the truth is you don't see it coming even there in the wrinkled bed for the sixth or is it seventh visit that season. Your beloved covers a bowl of canned peaches, the only taste nowadays that appeals. You want to save it. You plan to eat it later. You wait for your children to arrive at the bedside as they always do exhausted and deeply happy to see you still there, still alive, bright-eyed, but they know, shrinking. Your face is fuller now with fluids your kidneys retain, which helps everyone forget that your legs under a stack of sheets and blankets are nearly fleshless. You know the doctors by name and they, you. You know which nurses will glide in to usher each dumbstruck family member from the room hours after you've passed to the next world. Hours they've spent sobbing, wondering, and pleading, your chest still rising and falling in rhythm endlessly, it seems, as though the only barrier between you and them were a blissful sleep of recovery, a dream of being lifted with love and carried home. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Those were um, beautiful, uh, really, really lovely. And um, uh, Jill, you're next. Thank you, Heather. And thanks for everyone being here. 
Siberian. On the day they killed the last caribou, I was in love and I did not know caribou or cities or the needs of either. I did not know Scylla and did not know a new love would be hired. As remembering. This new love and I, we drove once between cities of snow and through the trees, I could see a herd moving, matching us, pulling away. If you thought the river blessed you, say the river forks, never the same river twice, never true, but forgetting as it goes. Now it shrugs dull afternoons, now talks without listening. Has it ever hesitated? It doesn't cut because it wants to. Let what runs wide run and decide nothing. It does not, if it does, love any less. Yesterday, the girl with the sad half moon mouth said, the North Pole could be anywhere. All of January came and went, and I did not go with it. I stayed here. There's something I figured out about the dark, because when she said the North Pole could be anywhere, I somehow understood that. And because all of January came and went and I did not go anywhere with it. Now in the dark, my sentences offer only half of themselves. I fear I taught them this. I fear I could be anywhere too but here is almost convincing. I have stayed very still to listen to it. I am so still now, you could almost be coming through the door and have just laid your keys on the counter. You could almost have just tried to move something heavy and made that one sound when it wouldn't budge. I can't remember enough sounds, the little ones that get you from room to room. Never is most of the sound I hear now, all around the pieces of your voice, which I try to gather about me and smooth again like a skirt sky to memorize. Never is such dark water and the words little boats, the children in them scooping out the water with their buckets. It's meant a great deal to have uh, my poems appear in Alaska Quarterly Review. Um, so I appreciate that very much. Um, this is the first poem that appeared in the journal. Help. When I got there, it was mostly over. 
the ballooner leaning hard against the green dusk of the field. Raining in like a great steed, this bright cloud whipping into collapse. I watched it calm and lose its breath. It was hard not to think of an accident. The basket tipped on its side. A quiet dirt road, one lane and remote. The sun had done its skimming. Exhausted, once again, its lovely argument. The contours of the lake lost to cloud. My neighbors upstairs have been making love all evening. Even for sex, it's an unusual number of footsteps. His, then hers. What sound like purposeful trips across the room as if in the midst of ecstasy, they are also managing a small kitchen fire. I love it in the morning, the sound of her above me, rushing around in her heels. She is so young, she does not want to be late. Lucky. The burglar did not take your cat. Thank God. Not a lonely guy, I guess. Not someone concerned with extending his life expectancy. Though that doesn't sound like most intruders, you know. Chances are he already has a cat. Maybe almost everything. Maybe the two of them share quality time during the day before he leaves on a job. They may go for long country drives in someone else's car or enjoy casual strolls through town appreciating the details, of alleyways, windows. Evening comes, the light dwindles. They might sit close, watching Jeopardy, testing themselves with the final question, which is something, now that you think about it, you and your cat have never done. And it's too bad, really, because you could use someone to be still and quiet with on the couch after work. This next poem is titled after uh, the town in Wales. Tenby. Because there are people here precisely and because they stand up to particular waves and sand bites as part of a larger relentlessness of wind because children pluck shells for cradled buckets, mothers dip toddlers' feet to the tide. Because later only gulls stamp their anxious hungers. I may believe in it. I fill one sock with certain stones in case it exists and in case it doesn't.
banquet. The morning after was like a carnival's wake. The streets quiet and dusty, everywhere almost one color, a shoulder, a shoulder, stars, if there had been stars, partial. But there were cranes eating, carefully picking their way through dying grass down by the sea. They surrounded and slowly began to approach as if innocent, the extended hands of a small cabin's Madonna. It was all true. Enough sun and air, enough water, enough blue. The land was bouquet, umbles of umbles. When the bride was full at breakfast, I ate what was left of her soup. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jill. That was um, marvelous, wonderful. Um, you you have such a, a presence. I know. Um, uh, just just seeing in the way you present your poetry is really. Thank you, thank you. And now uh, now we have Matthew. Um, hi everyone. Um, wow, that was those are really great readings. Um, kind of have, having that thing where it's hard for me to get out of being a listener. Um, I really, I really love those poems. Thank you, Dilberba, and thank you, Jill. Um, really, really did. Um, and thanks, Heather and Ron, and uh, for including me. Um, it was a thrill to be in the Alaska Quarterly Review whenever I was, and um, I always felt like vicariously in Alaska. I'm, I'm. I'm one of those people who if the Arctic is even mentioned in a book or a movie, I'm immediately like 1000% in. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm so I just, even the idea that the poems got to go to Alaska figuratively was, was, was a thrill. So, and I, I, I hope that you have lots of success in your fundraising and that AQR keeps going into the indefinite future, whatever it might hold. Um, yeah. So, um, I was sort of going back and yeah, looking at the poems from that time. And uh, I thought I would read some work from around then. Um, this is a poem called, uh, There is a Light. Um, this is, uh, that's a Smith from a Smith song. And I wrote it, um, I was living in Slovenia and um, there was an all night market like across from where I where I was staying and there was a little balcony where I'd go out and smoke and watch it. And it was like the only action in town basically. So I would just sit and watch this market for hours. So this is this um this is a poem that's kind of comes out of that. Um there is a light. Whenever behind your windows I look from my balcony down at you, you are open. At any hour among the pyramids of eggplant and whiskey, Albanian shadows drag their shadows. I could watch this shadow clock for hours and do. It is timing me. And each time your doors part, my lips hydraulical, silently clatter. Oh, solemn, untamed, maternal Albanian market. Why at this fucked time of night are you open? Locked within yourself, and asking the same thing of me. Small, leaning over the balcony figure, watching your painless hydraulic scar from both sides open, releasing silence. In silence, you've been here forever since 1993. You assure me with your calm, ancient terror. You force a man who looks on you to doubt his sleep and lack of sleep. 
O most magnificent pregnant man, you give birth to things surrounded with chocolate and things with chocolate buried inside them. You give birth to pine scented dishwashing fluids. You give birth to placenta, which some people eat. You give birth to etc. as every pleasure and every hour. O oh, low market wearing the naked dress of windows, lettered with emerald translucent letters. What pale green inside me memory dress now gives birth to the story of you, giving birth to the story of me, giving birth to my awe of you at 3 a.m. giving birth to a mother of her sleeping children young and free, who with pale green Arabic music leaking from one of her earrings, looks up with her gaze and unlocks me, then turns into her drifting toward the opposite and therefore holy direction. Um, this next poem is called January, it seems appropriate. Um, I wrote it, thankfully, a, quite a while ago, I, I had just started taking a new brand of antidepressants. Um, and I, I find the warnings on uh, pharmaceutical items to be quite hilarious. Um, and so this, this takes some of the, this imagines like a, a, a warning, like a kind of pharmaceutical warning as part of it. Um, it's basically one long depression medication warning. Um, January, the small cities touch each other with snow. There's no any longer to miss. Only this shadow phonograph still running its shadow needle over and over that after the record static, making an after sound cave I love to sit in and listen to part of me scaring that part of me willing to crawl just a bit farther out onto the sound of ice long after I hear it cracking. For a time in January, letters to pharmaceutical companies didn't seem even a little contrived. I was genuine and grateful and wanted to thank them. And though for, to thank them, for I thought I could hear them saying, thank you. And though you may for weeks feel a frozen lake on a public access station inside you, reading a list of cloud cancellations, the window will turn surely neutral. Shortly, you will begin to bump as if filled with helium along from room to room, picking up and holding you to your ear, saying, you sound like a program about calm parts of the ocean caught by bunny ears loosed from a 70s zenith. You sound like you think by rhythmically limping to help the apartment below compose an overture to a symphony known as science of eluding. Nobody wanders along the strings. In such a thought, one could be beautiful, like a ballet starring a naked, but for a half-dressed in pink tulle she once wore a mirror, holding a shard of spring. During reacclimation to time, we recommend you keep on doing that science of eluding thing. Don't look too hard for the manual. Allow some things to leave you unfinished. Walk on leaking, stray. Always a left behind bird sleeps on the science of patience shall always elude you wire. Is that you? Some trees we have built cast meaningful shadows. They misinform you, warnings from the other side of the veil will if you do just a little more good than you're able be brought you. You are a coast that drifts towards able to wake to holding those one or two moments she let you sleep in her lap. Those one or two moments January me now but only for one or two moments. Um, during this time period, I, um, I came across, I was traveling and I was in Chicago. And as many of you know, Chicago has two newspapers. Um, and I was looking at it and they both had horoscopes, which struck me as funny um, because I wanted to see if they would match. Like, you know, could you, could you like get this or did they contradict, you know, your astrological signs? So I, I, I took, this one day's uh, the, the, the horoscopes from both these um, papers and I cut them up and I mixed them up and made this poem. So um, it's called Tonight You'll Be Able. So all this language is from the horoscopes from that day. Uh, Tonight you'll be able. It may feel good to go wherever. Desires lead you into old, familiar, destructive awareness. Going a thousand miles away seems to be keeping up. Unsettled and anxious signals, they're so microscope. Be a sleuth. 
tiny sparkling under those around you sees you feeling and waiting. Life today is slow moving coworkers. Respond by giving your profile a new sense of clarity and feel ready to share your outlook, even if they may not be as excited. It makes you good to spread your joy. People, it's harder to be yourself. A series of role playing opportunities appeases, showing the authentic you won't hurt anything. Focus on your lovely find that there are many more things. Tonight, you'll be able to talk to anyone about anything. Make all the loved ones muster up, chat with character, keep alive the conversations. You feel you're getting something someone gives you. The key to a series of coincidences you play matchmaker to. An odd couple, the present you and the future in a big suit, a new haircut, or better than anticipated, funds. A few minor changes to June. Love partners, your lucky numbers are four, seven, 18, 21, and 32. Ask yourself, what would I do if I knew I could not fail? Um, I don't have any poems about Alaska, but this is the closest I can get. This poem is called Canada. <laughs> um, I know it's not, that's not really the same thing, but um, it's as close as I can get. So um, Canada. And I have this thing, I'm gonna confess, I have this thing where in every one of my books, I quote Joni Mitchell somewhere. So I think Joni might get two quotes in this, in this poem, I'm not sure, I can't remember, but at least one. Canada. By Canada, I've always been fascinated. All that snow and acquiescing, all that emptiness, all those butterflies marshaled into an army of peace. Moving north away from me, Canada has no border. Away like the state, its northern border withers into the sky dome. In a world full of mistrust and self-medication, I've always hated Canada. It makes me feel like I'm shouting at a child for letting a handful of pine needles run through his fist. Canada gets along with everyone while I hang a dark cloud above the schoolyard. I know we need war, all the skirmishes to keep our borders where we've placed them, all the migration, all the difference. Just like Canada, the Dalai Lama is now in Canada and everyone is fascinated. When they come to visit me, no one ever leaves me saying, the most touching thing about him is he's so human. Or I was really glad to hear so many positive ideas, regardless of the consequences expressed. Or I could drink a case of you. No one has ever peddled every inch of thousands of roads through me to raise awareness for my struggle for autonomy. I have pity, but no respect for others which is not compassion, just ordinary love based on attitudes towards myself. I wonder how long I can endure. In Canada, the leaves are falling. When they do, each one rustles maybe to the white-tailed deer of sadness. And it's clear that whole country does not exist to make me feel crappy, like a candelabra hanging above the prison world, condemned to freely glow. I read that poem in Canada once and, and then when I was done, I was walking out, I was very embarrassed and I was walking out of the room and I heard one person say to another, did he say white-tailed deer of sadness? <laughs> and I wanted to say, no, <laughs> no, I would never say anything like that. That's terrible. <laughs> um, I'll just read a few more and then, and then we can chat a bit. Um, let's see. Um, Um, I kind of want to read this poem because it reminded me a bit of a poem that um, Jill read. Um, not really in its form, but somehow in its subject matter. So um, and I can't remember the, the name of the poem, Jill, but that I, it's it just, I thought of it. So I thought maybe I'd just read this one and then one more after it. Um, it's called Work. I used to I used to go to this like writing space in downtown San Francisco and um, I would ride my bike through through and it was one of those times when the economy was so strong in the Bay Area. So I'd be riding my crappy little silver bike through all these like Teslas and Hummers and 22 year billionaires with 
in sneakers that cost more than my rent and stuff. So anyway, I wrote this, I wrote this poem and um, it's called Work. This morning, I rode my gray metal bike through the city, throwing its trucks at me. Sometimes along the narrow designated lanes with white painted symbolic bicyclists, so close to the cars, too close to my shoulders. And sometimes down alleys where people on piles of clothes lie sleeping or smoking or talking in the shade. Cars parked there have signs in their windows that the doors are unlocked and there is no radio. It is remarkable to me that downtown is always so remarkable to me. Every single time I feel so shiny, mixing my intention with all the other lives, each so much more interesting and easy for me to imagine than the tourists muttering to each other over their maps and some garbled by traffic or wind language I never quite hear. From my window, the old brick factory with its large white graceful letters seems to be actually proudly saying William Henry Steele to the sky. The building floats up and to the right, but it's the clouds, of course, that move. Or is it? The earth moves. Farther off, a squat little tower with three huge metal cylinders that must be for sending some invisible electrical particles out into the city. I only feel free when I'm working. That is, writing this book about a pair of zombie detectives who painstakingly follow clues they think are hidden in an authentic Tuscan cookbook. It's really more sort of transcribing. Every day I close my eyes and see them in an ancient yet modern high ceilinged earth toned kitchen, laughing as they blunder through the recipes, each day a little closer towards the name of their killer whose face will soon to all of us be clear. They have a little zombie dog. I name him William Henry Steele. And this will be my great work time has brought me here to do. I should have said that I worked with a lot of like, kind of like really writers who sell a lot of books. And we were sort of joking about like what poem would sell a lot and it'd be like, it'd have to have a zombie in it. It'd be a detective story, you know, be a cookbook with recipes for Tuscany and stuff like that or site. So I, my, my task was to like put all those things into the end of the poem. So um, I'll just read, I'll read one more and then, and then we can, we can chat a bit. Um, I'd love to hear. Um, I think I'm just going to read this, this, this poem. It was, I wrote it for my, my niece. Her name is Hannah. So it's just called poem for Hannah. The tiny bee on its mission died before it felt a thing. Its body rested for a moment on the railing of my sunny porch in California. Then wind took it away. You're an older sister now, so it's true the world owes you massive reparations. Also, you have special alarm pheromones implanted in your nose that explode with facilia distance, i.e. wild heliotrope. Each time what they say will happen turns out to be a compendium of what can never exactly be. Today, the electric bus full of humans listening through tiny flesh-colored earbuds to the music, news, or literature perfectly calibrated to their needs, kneels before the young man in his gleaming black wheelchair. Inside green laboratories, experiments in the realm of tiny particles are being for our vast benefit completed. Already I can see the same little wrinkle I have appearing on your brow. You were born to feel a way you don't have a word for. Okay, thanks. And thank, thanks again to Jill and to Dilruba. And uh, it's great to hear your work. Oh, thank you. I, 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 I'd love to hear um, you all talk amongst yourselves a little bit. And one of the uh, questions that we've asked throughout the series um, is, is kind of based on um, um, Louise Glick and a, 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 an observation that she had that um, writing is a kind of revenge against our circumstances, you know, bad luck, loss, pain, what a lot, what all of you write about and that, and that she says that if you make something out of it, then you're no longer bested. You're no longer bested by those events. And I, I wonder, um, you know, in, in, if that's something that you you think about when you're when you're writing your poems, or if they come from 
the, the harder things, the pain and loss, or, or if they come from the happier stuff. If you don't want to talk about that, you don't have to <laughs> just talk about whatever you want. <laughs> I don't mean to, I don't want to put you on the spot. I think anything you say is going to be. No, it's an, that's an intense question. I mean, that's like, I, that we all like kind of. Well, I, I mean, you're all of us kind of step back a little bit there like that. You're, you're here to tell us the meaning of life. <laughs> all right. I want to know. <laughs> So I, I don't know, maybe that's, maybe that's too much. Maybe it's just smaller, but um, you know, but you, you write about grief, your, your son, you know, and initially that um, uh, uh, Rupert does too, with, with that, all the stories about her father and Jill's pumps have a, have a kind of allegiant quality to them. I don't uh, know as much about the background of those, um, but um it just seems like you're you're all coming from a place of maybe some difficulty in turning it into something beautiful and expressive. Well, I will say I I hadn't thought about um, and I and I I uh, did not know that that quote um, about revenge. It's that's interesting to think about. Uh, but I will say that. Um, not only difficult things or painful things, loss or you know grief, um, but but things. I find I uh, often write about things that are um, difficult for me to to absorb or to understand whether whether that is a difficult thing or a painful thing or if it's um, just something um, sort of overwhelming and um, beyond and bigger than me that to the extent that um, an attempt through language to, to try to come to terms with it or to try to understand it fully um, for myself, I think that's how I, um, how writing um, happens or, or how I'm in relationship with, with writing. It's um, like another sense, using another sense to sort of understand the world, whether it's the events are anywhere on the spectrum, you know, it's just, yeah. Are, are the drafts of your poems as measured as, their, as the final, um, uh, as the final draft, as the, as the final poems are, um, are you as as careful in placing each word? Is is that for me, Heather, or is everyone answering? Yeah, that? no, that that's for you. I, I, oh, I'm just thinking sorry. about listening. Yeah, to um, not always, not always. I think it it changes um, depending depending on the on the piece. Sometimes they're very much like um, how they start. Um, and then other times, uh, you know, and, and sometimes after years, they're, um, you know, they might be very different or very pared down. Um, yeah, so it's, it depends, yeah. Yeah, okay. it's not always the same, yeah. And, and Ruba, when you were writing, you know, um, about about the grief and, and loss. Did you did 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 you feel like then, as as that quote said, that then you were no longer bested by the situation? It's a good question. I I don't know um, that I would say that it was a form of revenge or that I felt like I could you know sort of be in command of those experiences. But it was definitely I would sort of echo Jill's sentiment. I think it was a way of processing what happened with my father's illness and death. I um, mean, it took a while, you know, I was writing while he was ill, but I didn't want to write about mortality, chronic illness. I didn't want to write about cancer. And so I was kind of skirting the issue, you know, the big things, the things that mattered uh, for a long time. And then um, likewise, after he passed away, uh, it took about a year before I was able to start writing about, you know, the things that really mattered. 
Um, and then the writing kind of came in a flood. So I think for me, it's um, not so much about getting revenge over a, 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 you know, a tough experience, um, but more about making sense of things. It's, you know, I think of writing as my primary mode for making meaning of, of my experiences and making sense of the world. Um, so, you know, processing, exploring, and, and sort of making sense of things, I think, are probably the way I would describe it, um, rather than a kind of revenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, that is an interesting word. I hadn't even thought about that, you know, that uh, revenge, I guess, is kind of a, a harsher one, but more like a, um, a triumph over circumstances, I guess, might be the way I would interpret the poems that, that you all have shared today. Matthew said something in an interview that I read about um, poetry being the, that a poem should be, you know, the only way that you can explain something. And I, and I wonder if you can um, expand on that, that the poem itself is the only way to tell something, mm -hmm. some emotion, some story, something particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe I said should, I, 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 that maybe I, it sounds like me that I would go over the <laughs> overboard and, and make a big rule like that. Um, but uh, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I think for me, it feels that like, I'm not satisfied unless it feels like it's doing something I couldn't do some other way. I, mm -hmm. um, and I wanna come back to, you know, Louise um, is very stern uh, and, and, and she, she, it's, uh, well, I think part of what she's talking about is that in that quote is that the feeling she has after writing a poem is that she, she won in a way, or like she, she triumphed over it or whatever hard things happened, it was kind of worth it. And I think that there is a cruel truth to that about any kind of writing um, that you can feel after you've written about it successfully that in a sick kind of way, it was worth it. Um, not that you really had a choice anyway, so it doesn't really matter that you feel that way. You know, it's not like you chose the experience, but it's just, um, so I, th I think she's being characteristically honest about, about an aspect of the experience, but um, I'm not, I don't think of it so much that way. I think like poems for me, like language, I mean, they have a private aspect and a public aspect and they, every poem locates itself somewhere in that dynamic, you know, and poems can be anywhere along that, in that space. And um, I guess I, I, I look for what's common. Um, so if I'm, if I've been through something good or bad, when I, when I, I think the poem in a way has to somehow reach out from that experience and try to, try to harmonize with with an aspect of that that might be true for other people um and then when that happens that makes me feel like my life hasn't been entirely wasted um, so but but that's but that's but that's me but that's me you know like i mean I'm, I, I don't i wouldn't say if somebody had a totally different way of putting it i wouldn't like say that they weren't doing it the right way i'm just talking about that's like a personal thing for me you know that i feel that way you know, after after hearing um, um, Ruba and and Jill's poems, do you have any particular questions that you'd like to ask them? Um, I don't know, Ruba. When I was listening to your poems, I was thinking, I was wondering, like, how? Well, I have a lot of things I'd like to talk to you about someday about the image and about metaphor and about um, about your ideas about all that. But I was wondering, you know, who you who you read or who you go to, like, what your what your well of inspiration is. I mean, I couldn't help, Lorca was bouncing around in there for me when I, but but in, in a way, you know, and Jill, I have a whole separate set of questions for you about, you know, how you think of the sentence and how you think of, you know, mm -hmm. statements. And I just loved mm -hmm. how you said that thing in one of your poems like about how, um, all, was it all your sentences seem unfinished? Is that what it was? Is that, is, that, is that something like that you said? I'm sorry, or like partial, like, like but there's this way that you have this way of making direct statements that are complete in of themselves, but they, in their completeness, they leave so much space for other things to happen. And I just love that constant conjuring of like negative space in your mm -hmm. poem. So those are the two mm -hmm. <laughs> off the top of my head, things that first came to mind about each of your poems, but I have lots of other things I could ask about them, but I don't know. I'd love to hear you talk about those things, both of you, if you wouldn't mind. I'll, I'll jump in. Thanks for asking Matthew. And I'd love to ask the same of you too. I think, 
you know, just sort of depends on the day for me on any given day, I'm likely to give a different set of answers. But um, certainly in this book, I was thinking about um, <clears throat> poems like uh, poets like Aga Shahid Ali, who have a, 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 such an amazing way of reading. My teacher. Lucky you, right? Amazing. I, I didn't have the chance to meet him, unfortunately. Um, but he has such an amazing way in his work of uh, weaving the personal and the political. You know, there is that sort of gesture outward, um, but also work that's deeply rooted in personal things. So, um, you know, I look to that kind of work and, and um, uh, I think also, um, you know, there's so many really on any given day, I could give you a different answer, but um, I'll say, you know, Elizabeth Bishop, um, Rick Barrett, in this book, I was also looking at the work of um, Nicanor Parra and Carlos de Drummond de Andrade. Um, uh, so, you know, it, there are a lot of um, different poets that I admire, but I think right now what's on my mind is really thinking about how to kind of navigate the personal and, and the public or the personal and the political um, in ways that are meaningful, that, you know, um, sort of rise above what we were just talking about, you know, rise above the personal experience or experience of something, whether that's painful or joyful, whatever it is, but thinking about how it might resonate outwards. I love Andrade, and I now that you've said that, I hear I hear that, not not like I totally hear that. I I adore Andrade. I think he's like one of the greats, and I mean, of course, he's one of the greats. But I mean, that's really cool. And we'll talk about Shahid some other time. He was, yeah, yeah, definitely. And Jill, what about um, the the question that 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 Matthew asked about that that empty space the the things left out? Um, yeah, how, Matthew, how, how, how was the question again? What's the question I'm- Oh, I mean, it was just sort of an observation about your work because yeah. uh, I, I hadn't had time, but I mean, I was just yeah. wondering how you thought about the sentence because I, I just thought it would be one of the things that's so interesting about your work is that it's so direct and you have this direct way of making statements and that of course could be a type of thing that would take up a lot of space and not leave room for anything but mm -hmm. somehow like paradoxically that directness and statementness of your poems like seems to leave like even more space for like resonance mm -hmm. and mystery and the unsaid and I just was like mm -hmm. it's it's this par it's this paradox I'm not I'm, I'd have to like study those poems you read mm -hmm. to see how you did it and I probably still wouldn't know but I was I was wondering if you, you know, had, if you thought I was onto something or think I'm like nuts or whatever, or both. <laughs> no, no, but I'm really, I'm fascinated um, to think about that. Um, I, I do like, I do like to just think about um, the sentence as, as a form. Um, and I, I mean, I'm always working um I'm always working in in full sentences. I don't really ever abandon that um, that format. But um, yeah, um, I I want to think more about um, like this paradox that you've mentioned about the directness. You know how how does one speak directly um, and and maybe, you know, present ordinary speech um, in a sentence form and yet leave, leave room for and leave space for um, for other other thoughts or other things to happen, you know, like room for um, well, please don't think too hard yeah. about it because whatever yeah. you're doing is working really well. <laughs> don't don't, don't, well, don't no, think too hard about it. I, I just I just was observing. I mean, yeah. I guess, and I love the sentence as as a poetic unit. I'm I'm yeah. fascinated. I mean, I'm obsessed yeah. with sentences. Yeah. Um, it's, and punctuation I, too. Yeah. yeah. Sentences are my like they are probably my default unit yeah. of like of 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 prosody or whatever. Like I guess mm -hmm. I would say that's the right word. But like so I'm mm -hmm. I'm. I'm obsessed with that. So, and I see that, that all the different possibilities of that for you are like really, are those new poems that you read or are they, are they like, I know. 
There are really, um, they really span. Um, but I mean, are they from an unpublished years. Case, I guess I'm asking? Um, none of them um, have been, I guess one was in a chat book. Um, one was in an, an older chat book, but other than, other than that, they've they've been in journals, but no, they they aren't in um, in books. But. I have I have one question. Um, as we kind of wind up, we're only four days from the inauguration, mm -hmm. eighteen days from the sixth of January, uh, and the fifth of January too, which was pretty uh, dramatic. And uh, Matthew's poem about Canada, mm -hmm. right, and how how uh, Americans may view Canada um, and maybe Matthew because he likes the north even has more investment in it. I wonder um, as we take this um, event and sort of close it out, has anything uh, changed in your mind about our country? How you, how you view um, the country? How you view yourself in the country? Um, Things could have been very different on uh, January 20th, as we, we now know. And I think, um, I'm just wondering how you're feeling and how that, as we take this out, it's four days fresh, um, a young poet is getting the front page of the New York Times um, with, with her inaugural address. Um, people are thinking about poetry. I mean, an enormous amount of attention to that uh, poem, I justified, but not usual uh, poems on the front page of the New York Times. What do you think? And is there anything, where, where, do, you, where do you go from here? Is it, and I just, the, the thought again has to do with Matthew um, talking about the personal and the public. So I'm talking about that. Aruba has quite a bit of uh, material that, that we've read that actually deals with um, uh, the politics and the world um, and so on um, that we've seen at Alaska Quarterly. So I just, I thought that we might end on that because it's so fresh, right? Mm -hmm. And we're there right now. And that amazing poem about Canada and their lovely border and all those people collectively. By the way, you know, we're surrounded by Canada uh, <laughs> uh, up here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, are. I mean, which is a good thing, uh, but what do you think? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, that poem is, a, you know, just pure reaction formation and jealousy, right? From, from Americans. Um, and projection um but yeah the the applicable projection the 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 um yeah i don't know i mean i i'm of course very pleased that the poem uh the inaugural poem was so well received i mean she's uh, miraculous that <laughs> that young woman i i can't believe she was able to pull that off um and both the poem and the performance it just was i'm i'm in awe of that um, I, uh, yeah, I don't, do I feel different? I mean, I feel relieved um, and also just shaken by the task in front of us, I guess. And like most people, I don't know if I have anything. I do feel like, you know, we do need singers still. Um, and we need people to like radically break the way that people communicate with each other and sort of break through and communicate in some kind of other way, like a sudden, way to leap across things and say things that can't be said or we didn't know could be said or and you know poets are aristotle said you know poets are metaphor makers right they they and so they 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 see resemblances where other people's don't other people don't and i guess if we need one thing right now it's people who see resemblances where every, where we where everyone sees difference so i think maybe you know who knows maybe the poets are gonna have, have the key to it all Yeah, I'm just thinking about a time when I visited Canada soon after Trump came into office and I just walked through neighborhoods thinking, this person has health care and this person has health care and just, you know, sort of dismayed and, and awed by it. Um, I think what I'm feeling right now is relief, like a lot of people, but I think too that 
there's a lot of ugliness that's been in our country for a long time. And part of what happened in the four, last four years is that it was sort of given permission to come up to the surface and you know, bubble out and explode. And so it's not that it's gone away now, you know, it's just that we're more aware of it and there was an atmosphere that um, sort of let it become permissible. Um, so, you know, I definitely feel relief, um, but I, I'm also thinking hard about, you know, what does this mean for me as a person and as a writer? And um, so, you know, a little part of what I'm trying to do is think about uh, Claudia Rankin's speech at AWP some years back um, you know, she talks about writing as this arena of discomfort and how we have to kind of keep that discomfort on the table, keep difficult questions on the table and stop, you know, sort of erasing race. So as someone who's, who's not white and not black, but is a person of color, um, one of the things that I'm trying to tackle my work that's proving to be very difficult is um, trying to grapple with the, the model minority myth and to figure out, you know, like, how do I want to go about representing this uh, and writing about it and sort of interrogating it um, because it's it's part of you know a system that's divided people of color in service of white supremacy. So uh, I can't say that anything I've written has come to fruition, but it's something that I'm trying to sit with, uh, you know, among other things, to just kind of you know explore uh, some themes that are uncomfortable and um, feel risky to to you know sort of go public with um, in terms of offending my home community. So um, you know I think. I think Matthew's right. We're always going to need art, and I do think it, you know, has a lot of potential to connect people. We've seen that happen in the past. So, um, you know, I feel I feel hopeful. I feel hopeful um, and relieved, and uh, you know, disturbed still, like the rest of us, but definitely relieved and and you know, willing to allow myself to feel a little hope. Jill, you want to weigh in on this one or not? Oh, I, no, I'm, I think those were great. I think that's, <laughs> that was great. Yeah. I do think we're, we're now we're getting it. This is actually the longest we've gone and, and I'm supposed to be the gatekeeper of time. So I, I want to thank you all um, very much for being so generous and, um, and hanging out another 20 minutes past the time that we, we told you to be here. Um, I also want to say, I could, I would love to just hear you all talking for a whole nother hour. I could, I could listen to the, the three of you um, go in between poems and conversations and I think I'd come out of it. I know I'd come out of it a lot um, uh, wiser and more compassionate. So thank you uh, very much um, for, for your work thank you. and, and thank you um, for being here. I also, um, uh, on behalf of the, uh, the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts um, want to thank um, everybody, all our gratitude and generosity, not just for our, our, our terrific um, uh, poets, but also to Cody Carver and the staff at the Anchorage Museum at the Rasmussen Center who produced this program and again encourage um, those of you that enjoyed um, hearing from these poets and are enjoying the series to um, uh, of course, it's it's free, but if if the spirit moves you uh, to make a donation, that would be uh, a very uh, nice thing too. We're um, modestly hoping to raise fifteen thousand dollars, and we're um, well on our way. So uh, uh, thank you again for that. And um, Ron, you can tell us about what's happening next week. Yes, and I want to uh, echo what you said about the museum and the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts and also for the generosity of our three poets, uh, Ruba, Joe, and Matthew, for not only supporting us um, as contributors to the journal, but of yourselves by making time um, for this event. Um, this has been a big series started on October uh, 4. We have 10 events um, upcoming between now and on May 2nd. Um, We'll only talk about one uh, with the names uh, next Sunday, January 31st. Um, we have three fiction writers uh, whose work in AQR all receive special recognition. Um, Melinda Moustakis, Hannah Zahir, and Arna Botemps Hemingway. And um, it looks to be a um, really cool event and um, really grateful uh, to the three of you for uh, taking the time and not only supporting us, but just with gratitude for your work. 
I did want to say one other thing, Ron, before we left, because I know um, people have sent me some notes asking, you know, where can I find um, uh, uh, the work of, of many of the people who have been on this series? And um, it's easy. You can go to the website for Alaska Quarterly Review. You can read uh, the bios. You can Google them. And what I've been doing, even here in Haynes, is ordering um, many volumes of poetry, prose, uh, from the local bookstore. And it's really fun. I'm, I'm developing quite a library now, but it's um, if, if your bookstore doesn't have it, you can order them. And that's a really good way to show your support uh, for poets and writers as well. Exactly. So with that, I wanna thank you all and um, a good afternoon to, to Jill and uh, for the other two. Oh, actually, you're on Pacific also, Matthew. It's not that late. You still have light. Now, Ruba, on the other hand, might not be so bright as it here is in the West Coast. So um, with that, um, thank you so much for participating with us.